What's up guys, this is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing well. I'm really excited about today's episode. We talked to Mr. Jared Lagness, a National Academy of Sports Medicine master trainer with over 20 years of experience in the training world. And being able to have a great conversation with somebody like that doesn't happen super often as I'm a trainer of 13 years myself and, and it's hard to find people who have been in the training industry longer than I have. But Jared's journey both personally and professionally has brought him to a place where he's gotten to experience a lot of different modalities of training. And one of those was new to me and I'm very excited to bring that conversation to you today as we talk about animal flow and why you should be incorporating it into your workout program. You'll love it. Your kids will love it. And after our conversation, you know exactly where you need to start. Before we get there, two items of housekeeping. First, stay tuned for next week's release of Exercise in the Brain, Part 4, Depression. Given the recent report of the life expectancy of the United States going down partially because of the suicide rate in young adults and because of my experience working with clients who have been depressed, I believe this might be my most important work yet. As you know, I've been talking about this part four for a while, and I've done an immense amount of research to bring this show to you, and I'm very excited to release that next week. So stay tuned for Exercise in the Brain part four, where we're going to be talking about the power of exercise to address depression in a top-down and a bottom-up fashion without the side effects that medication brings and with greater adherence than cognitive behavioral therapy. It's going to be a party. And then the second item of housekeeping is I encourage you, if you haven't checked it out in the last week or so, go to patreon.com slash definingdadbot. I've made some updates to the Patreon page that I think you'll be really excited about. And if you haven't raised your hand in support of the Defining Dad Bod movement yet, now is a fantastic time to do so. I won't spoil it here. I'll have you go check that out. But I will say I opened up the Defining Dad Bod inner circle to our $1 donors as well. So if you currently are a $1 contributor to Defining Dad Bod and you haven't connected to the Defining Dad Bod inner circle, reach out at facebook.com slash groups slash Defining Dad Bod and I'll make sure you get added. And to those of you listening who are potential patrons thinking about whether or not to support the Defining Dad Bod movement or whether or not the rewards in the inner circle or the newsletter will be powerful and beneficial for you, I encourage you to check that group out anyway. I'll give you a week before I ask you to become a contributor in the group. Again, that's facebook.com slash groups slash Defining Dad Bod. And that link is in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's join Jared and talk about animal flow, a powerful and potentially wild middle ground between yoga and hip hop. What's up, guys? This is Alex Van Houten with Defining Dad Bod. I hope you're doing very well here with a special friend and guest, Mr. Jared Langness. How are you doing this morning, brother? Doing great. Loving life. Awesome, man. I'm so excited <laughs> for this conversation. We're going to be talking yep. about teenage daughters. We're going to be talking about animal flow as a form of training. If you guys are interested in connecting with Jared, you can find him on Facebook at jared.langness. That's J-E-R-O-D dot L-A-N-G-N-E-S-S. Am I saying that right? That's right. Yep. Langness? Thank okay. You. And then you can also yep. find him on Instagram at Jared's Fitness of the same spelling. Jared, super <laughs> awesome to have you on the show, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So I would like to give our audience an opportunity to get to know you just a little bit because you're a guy worth talking to, especially with regard to training, to different forms of training, macro cycles, programming, helping clients get results and whatnot. You're one of the few I know in yeah. the trenches with clients and instructing trainers at their jobs. So can you tell me a little bit about your superhero origin story? Like where'd you come yeah. from? How'd you get here in five minutes or less? Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, so it, this all started from, of course, the, t the typical story everyone has is where love working out when you're a teenager. That's kind of where it started. And I, I had a best friend that had some medical issues. So he wound up going to college for kinesiology while he was dealing with all his medical issues. And then I was kind of riding his coattails. I was with my dad's plumbing company. Fast forwarding to where he was graduated and he was a fitness manager for 24-hour fitness. He saw some potential in me he, and he asked for me to kind of get with him and, uh, and meet the vice president and get started for part-time training. And it sounded like a great idea. So him and I went that route to go meet the vice president. And on our way there, we got in a head-on collision on I-25, which is the main interstate in Colorado. And he passed away in the car accident. I was, um, I, I was 
had a broken femur, two torn ligaments in my knee. They discovered a birth defect in my heart. Um, so my entire life changed at that point. And I basically gave up all the construction world and got into fitness to carry on his legacy. So yeah, so that was really how it all started. And then from there, I was like asking trainers for their textbooks. I was shadowing them. I was trying to get into the world of what they're all about, trying to see what makes them tick. What do clients really love about them? And from there, I just kind of rose up the ladder in fitness. And I went from... Uh, from yeah, from just being the peon person that racked weights and spotted people to being the assistant manager, the manager, and then went all over the place doing that. So, and it's been 20 years now since. Wow. So. <laughs> wow. What a deep yeah. calling too. Like, I mean, not, I talk about like getting hit in the face with a ton of bricks and I don't want to make light of that at all. That's yeah. so deep and powerful. It, yeah. And it, yeah, it was, it was such a life changer because I, I had to learn how to walk again um, so the physical therapy aspect was a real deep rooted thing for me. And I still to this day am friends with my first physical therapist and I've met like five since then. And it's just been, so I, the networking side of fitness has been like my biggest reward, I guess, from it, mm. um, to really get to know so many people just like yourself, where I can look, get to know people and know what makes them do what they do. Um, it's a driver and it's something that's in my heart now. It just never changes. And in this industry, it's been my experience, yeah. and I'm sure you would echo this, that there are no more passionate people than the people who have changed their life through health and fitness and then decide that that's what they want to do with other people. And they spend their days doing that day in and day out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, it's still, of course, challenging on things. And then there's a lot of time that to get back to think of where it all began. And I, I think there's a faith aspect, too, that really keeps me where I am, that, that makes it to where I can still see where I'm supposed to be. Um, I feel like God's led me to be here. And I'm really thankful for that. So tell me yeah. about your day to day at the moment. So yep. you, you talked about your superhero origin story. Like right now, I, I know yep. you're an instructor of trainers. I know that you train for the National Academy of Sports Medicine. I know that you have hands <laughs> on the regular. I also know that you you work with managing and helping trainers with their own businesses and stuff. Give, give yeah. us just a quick snapshot on what, you know, the early morning to the evening looks like. Jared. And then you come home to two teenage daughters and a wife. So that's it's, not anything it, either. It, yeah, it's a juggling thing for sure. And I think like the biggest challenge I've had for my entire career is finding that balance. So with that, my daily routine is like knowing clients that are coming for the day, make sure I'm ready for them. That one is the one I get out of the way because well, that's the easiest for me to make sure that's there. Um, and then like today, there's a book that, that I teach right now that we're in called Book Yourself Solid that um, we're towards the end of that. Um, so I have a class I'm teaching for those trainers that want to be involved in that. I don't make it mandatory because I want people that are passionate, that care. So I, so I have that going on. After that, I have another meeting where I take the entire staff and go over business things in that world. And then Lifetime Academy is coming too, as far as that's tonight. And then, of course, getting home. <laughs> um, I want to see my daughter's pretty amazing kids, of course. When I say kids, I got an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old. Um, one about to graduate, the other one's a freshman, they're both cheerleaders. So I deal with asking about injuries because that's something crazy about within their world. I never really thought of it as a sport, but it absolutely is. And they train all year round. So I'm wondering how things are going in that world. Of course, their academics are a major thing for us too. And of course, having fun. That's a big one. I, I realize like trying to get away from things that make us sit and, and lose connection is things I really watch for for that. But I, I hope that's helping with what you're asking for. But it's like, it's something that's always juggling. So Well, yeah. And, yeah. and I want to get into that fatherhood aspect and just yeah. I love the videos that you've got on your social yeah. media, you and your girls just like dancing and singing in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a sitcom. It's, it's perfect. Yeah. It's spontaneous. And something that that's, I guess I've done my entire life. I don't know as weird as that is, but it's like, um, I don't know why dancing is a thing, but it's just something that's just a fun thing that we've always done. But I think, I think music is pretty powerful and that's really been a great thing. I, I have no musical talent besides goofing off in the kitchen, but, <laughs> but it's been helpful to kind of get something that them to understand there's something that we connect connect with all the, way, all the time so yeah and i guess yeah. to the to the dads and moms listening it's important sometimes for our kids to see us let our hair down so to speak absolutely and have a grand old time because i, I don't know why the heck else are we working so dang hard anyway? <laughs> exactly and, and that's a big one for um my youngest daughter has a kidney disease too and that um that has been like a it, it my the bottom dropped out for me when i when that was discovered and it's for that i guess i cherish a lot more everything of everything because you just never know when she'll relapse again or anything in that world so we we're always doing like fundraisers and being connected with the, the Neff Cure Foundation that, that she's involved in. And um, there's no cause or cure for the disease. So it's something that we're always just trying to get and cherish every moment we have. Wow. You know, for the listeners who don't understand yeah. maybe a, a chronic disease with a child, can you? Yeah. I don't want to dig up some really hardcore personal stuff. No, I don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> can you help everybody understand like what hangs over your head, if anything? Yeah. 
that came from, because I understand she was diagnosed relatively young, correct? Yeah, she's about six years old when she was diagnosed. Mm. Um, you, I guess you always go inward and think of what did I do wrong? Is, did, was there something that I didn't do in the world of health that I, I let her have the wrong kind of foods? Did we do something that let her in some kind of like environment that caused this to happen? Because again, there's no cause or cure. I think about times in, in when she was a little kid, and, and again, there, there's there's no way I'll ever know that, and and there until they they say what causes these diseases. So with that, we just take the blessings that we have mm-hmm. and make sure that we're doing all the things we can. Like um, we made big changes in our nutrition in this house because of her, um, but it's not. But we've done it with with a, a good heart and, and a happy mindset, meaning that um, we find great recipes of organic foods and um, we keep our sodium low because that's what helps her the most. And then just again, keeping fun as a thing, like like we will have those treats where we go out to eat and put that aside for a bit, but then for the most part, do the right things and make the, whole, the, the entire family benefit and, and show her, of course, that she matters so much to all of us. And, and we just take it as a team. I love that. It's a huge balancing act. And you just said, yeah. as a family, we're on the same team. Yeah. We're one of the team members. So if that means yeah. all of us are eating less salt, then like high five, we'll take our salty snacks elsewhere. If it's got exactly, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Cause it's, it, and, and we're not hurting for it. And that's another thing about, um, we get in these, I guess our American culture, we just feel like we have to have these certain things. And if you're, if you'll realize you're not missing things by taking out like your typical Doritos or whatever else that people are having, it's like, we're okay. <laughs> so right. we're, we're okay. And yeah. we're together in it, right? We're exactly. Yeah. Doritos together. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, we've had other people that, that ask us questions about being parents with, with a kid in this condition. And they're like, well, do you make a separate meal for her? And then you have, it was like, no, it was like, we're going to make sure that we we're, we can all do this together and no one's suffering. There's no, we're, we're enjoying it. I mean, if there's a ways to really just, just maximize what's going on and, um, be thankful for what you have. So. Mm, well said. In either, there are some examples yeah. from my life. I can think of, you know, I have a client right now who yeah. their four-year-old has a severe allergy to eggs, like severe enough that if you ate a protein bar that had egg protein in it, and then you like give her a kiss on the cheek, she's going to you know, break out wow. and have a really hardcore reaction. So the whole family yeah. has written eggs off completely, which is hard, by the way, flip over mm. any food oh, yeah. processed minimally or heavily processed food and, and read the label. There's egg just about everywhere. Oh yeah. And if it's not there, it's been processed in a factory, factory. eggs and soy and stuff. And so, you know, even this mom is yeah. like, there are certain eyeshadows and mascaras yeah. I can't use wow. because egg is in the, in the ingredients list and you have to find that you know and in that family is so like you would think like oh man you can't have eggs like that's like cake and that's like every yeah. breakfast food I- <laughs> and, yeah. and oh yeah you know she would say we're happy to do it we're happy to partner together and make sure that we can make the most out of this pretty difficult situation for her. Uh, not that that's a kidney disease necessarily it's nice that she yeah no I, I get it though but, it's but it's the heart of saying, hey, we're a family. We're in this together. We're going to make the most of it. And, you know, honestly, once you're in the trenches, it's not like you're that worried about what you're missing out on. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, um, I think the balance of having a, re- a great wife, too, makes a difference. I mean, it's like, um, she, it's again, balance is the key word in that because there's things that she can do that I just can't in the sense of she's so much more methodical and organized on things that um, about how the meds need to be distributed, um, how she gets them set up for school. Because, like, we have to, now she's in high school, so we have to have, so she has these med times that happen and we have to make sure that they're accounted for, that the nurse knows what meds to have, that they're organized with it and she's on it. She knows, I mean, she, again, I'm the fun dad that does the cool things in that world. And of course I'm helping nutrition in that world and in the fitness, but then there's my wife that does the things that just, I'm not good at. And it's just, yeah, we got to find that, <laughs> that balance. Mm. So. I love that. How did you yeah. guys, you know, come to that? Because there's an operational component there. It just doesn't, oh, yeah. doesn't just happen. She doesn't go, hey, here's the things I'm going to be in charge of. Is this like you guys come together and talk about this sort of thing on the regular basis? Do you make time for that? Like, what does that look Yeah, like? well, I mean, um, it's an amazing component of having, um, knowing what you're good at in the first place. But rooted in love and grace is a big part of that. Meaning that she knows where I'm not, where things that I'm just not that great at. And she can understand that. And I know where her, where her heart goes to. So we kind of... I guess mold what fits that. So like in her organized fashion, I thought, okay, she's going to be the great at getting things. So because she has these like lists of what are where the medications are and what they're supposed to be for, what timing, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it helps me like because sometimes she'll go on trips where I'm doing it all on my own, but she's made it that easy where um, it's just set up. It's gonna it's gonna happen because of, of the dedication she's put in there. 
my job is very demanding as far as hours wise, which is something I've always wished I could figure out a better way. But with that, she, again, there's that balance. She really does help for that side. Powerful, man. Thanks for giving yeah. us a little like window yeah. to the yeah. personal underworkings of the Lagnus yeah. household because that, that's <laughs> a big deal. I wanted to, I don't want to switch gears too hard here, but I wanted to talk to you about kind of the animal flow concept of exercise and, and to make that a smooth transition, we'll just say flowing into, uh, that, <laughs> yeah, well we're played. Flowing, flowing this conversation into, so you talk about the flexibility of your household and how you're working together there. And I think that's a perfect connection with yeah. the idea of the animal flow methodology. Now, what? I'm going to yeah. be really honest here. I don't know very much about animal flow yeah. where you are probably, you know, collegiate level undergraduate animal. Flow. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the third grader who's like, I was going to be like a C squad, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Yeah. Uh, so with regard to animal flow, give us a brief overview. How did you come yeah. to this sort of training? And it, yeah. what is it? Yeah, it was kind of crazy. It was like the last class that was offered at a um, NASM conference in Arizona. It was like the last thing was on the list. I didn't know what it was. And it had a choice of like three options. And that was one of them. I was like, well, that one sounds goofy enough. Let's try it. And because I'm the same boat, like when I hear animal flow, what the heck is that? So I took the class and uh, Mike Fitch, the creator of it, was the instructor for the class. And it was this weirdest thing. He's in his bare feet. It's the only class that in the entire weekend event thing that, that someone's in his bare feet. And he just had us all sit on the floor and he started talking about what this is all about. And basically it's, he was a bodybuilder at one time that was frustrated that his body really couldn't move. It looked cool, but he never worked on mobility, flexibility, and it drove him crazy that he couldn't do things that he saw other athletes do. It's like, I have so, really big lats, but I can't scratch my own back. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it drove him crazy, and he wanted a, a revamp of, of to make it, because he wanted to be able to be mobile, flexible, and strong all at the same time. So he looked into, he, he said he had to really humble himself and do something that was out of his comfort zone. And he got into adult gymnastics. And I put myself there because I, I remember as a kid, I had the, the kind of dad that was really hardcore man that was not about having his kid, his boys in gymnastics. So I would sit on the sideline and watch my sisters do it while I was in baseball. But I was always in girl sport, huh? Ex exactly. <laughs> but I was so intrigued by it. Like I never told him that, but I was like, I wish I he would have put me in there. But growing up, I, again, I was the baseball, football, track guy, never touched gymnastics besides watching it. And then I hear this, what Mike Fitch, uh, again, humbling, he, he kind of, I sound like the same boat where he, his first time he ever had anything to do with it as, we, as an adult. And it made me think, man, how often do we need to put ourselves in those uncomfortable situations to, to grow? So he did that. He got into hip hop and he got into yoga, I guess. And that combination is where he came up with this concept of how powerful it is to get our hands on the ground and our feet and just let our bodies move in ways to really maximize. And it, so in that class, he taught four motions to really learn what that's like. In other words, we were in something called a, a beast where you're on all fours facing the ground. It wasn't a crab where you're face up. You these lateral ape walks where you're um, kind of doing an a ape-like cartwheel looking thing. And I forget the fourth one. Oh, it's it like a um, side kick through where you're putting your body, your leg goes sideways while you're, um, anyway, I'd have to show it to you. Um, but that's where it started. The podcast, you can't hear it yeah. right now, but Jared's yeah. trying to show you while <laughs> sitting in the chair what these movements are. <laughs> But I think that's yeah. actually one of the interesting things about animal flow yeah. is that most of the movements are named after an animal, which yeah. in the exercise world, this is a really difficult thing, the nomenclature idea. So if I say dumbbell pullover or lat pull down, you know, there are hundreds of different ways, barbell, dumbbell, kettlebell, that yeah. machine versus that selectorized equipment. There's hundreds of different ways to execute this thing. But in animal flow, it's your body and gravity. So yep. when you walk like an ape, you're like, there's only so many ways to walk like an ape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I find that really fascinating because a lot of the movements are named after animals to help that thing stick. And, th and that was something that really stood out to me when I was starting to put this into my movement practice was like, you can really picture what an ape does or you can really oh yeah what a crab does in attempt to make that happen for yourself oh yeah that, well and, and it's pretty cool it's amazing how he's actually um how he teaches it in the sense of like if you're not the most flexible you can still do these things you there's a place where you feel like where your body's letting you go and you go there and and that comes from a yoga kind of background too i think because you'll hear that a lot in that world i was gonna say i hear that in yoga classes you know like yeah. if, if your body's ready and you're willing to go there you know you can kick up into your handstand or exactly get deeper into the wheel or whatever exactly yeah so very same similar com, com, um ways in that too that you'll, you'll you can kind of see where your body's going and with that it kind of gives you some motivation so as i do animal flow it's again i still train everything else that i can do 
it makes me motivated to train in other things because I know like handstands are a big deal. I spend a lot of time working out. So I teach animal flow every week. And then after the animal flow is basically over, we move into gymnastics because it's now time to work on those moves where we can work on our handstands and cartwheels. And um, we even get on like that. We have those kind of monkey bars set up at, at lifetime where we're hanging on things, working on, on our grip strength and all that kind of stuff. So it does kind of, you do want to train strength as far as weights and all that to get better for animal flow. I was going to ask two questions yeah. here because that's really good. So one of the things that really attracts me about this is I, I'm going to make a few enemies here and I'm just going to say, yeah. I don't like yoga class. I just don't, yeah. I don't know what it, what it, I'm, I'm too competitive. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to go to <laughs> yoga and go like, I can do that. I'm going to figure out. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that, but I definitely do that. And I can't stop it. I don't know what's wrong with yeah. me. And then second, the idea of like, I have a two or three foot by six foot area to do my thing in, you know, and I have a hard time. I'm, I'm talking to you right now. Yeah. And I can't stand the camera. I'm like, I'm <laughs> moving around and yeah. you watch my three-year-old for three minutes and you you see exactly what's happening because that's happening in my brain yeah so yoga itself i've always tried it and maybe i'm missing the zen part maybe i need a few more years under my belt but, <laughs> but the, uh, I, I, I can't i can't get into it you know I, I can't no matter what i do i can't do it regularly but the animal flow thing i saw a lot of the hints of yoga in there but you have the whole world to work with oh yeah because the room and you have your body and and you and you're always moving and you couldn't even be competitive like i could do a better crab than you like what <laughs> yeah <laughs> well and, and that's a neat way to look at it because there is ways that you can kind of make it competitive in a way um and you need tons of space because the way it kind of starts off in a class is I do some stretches. So wrist mobility is a big deal um, because you're, and that's another thing that we never really think of in fitness is how we have to have, yeah, exactly how you can really move your wrists and make them work for you and have the strength in them. Um, that's nothing, I mean, as far as all my years of training, even when I, because I'm Olympic certified too, and it does, it matters as far as having the flexibility to get that bar and you're on, on, on holding that catch position. But even then, that's nothing compared to having that weight that you hold yourself with. I'm um, doing like a, a, cause there's like one arm rotations that you do. And there's, um, I can just think about the movement that you do, but it's basically like a backwards cartwheel thing. Your hand is holding you up your entire body and you're getting used. To, and there's like a forward traveling ape where you're getting, where you're jumping into your own hands and your body's, held by your wrists. There's that planche position. Um, you have to look that up if, for those that don't know, but you're holding all your weight. All your weight is in your hands on that one. So um, a, a whole new concept of how to, and, and, but that neuromuscular connection that happens when your hands and your feet are on the earth doing things changes everything. Mm. Man, I could talk about this with you for a long time. You know, I watching this thing, watching the yeah. because I, I looked it up when when you first got into it and stuff. You were yeah. first stuff, I was like, what the heck is this? <laughs> Finding people on YouTube who are doing this stuff, you know, because that's what trainers do. We're like, yeah, monkey see, monkey do. Uh, I'm gonna oh yeah, on myself before I dive into this any deeper. And it reminded me of a class full of four year olds. Oh yeah, acting like animals. Not with the, you know, if I got my kid in here, he'd be, oop, 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 I'm a monkey. <laughs> Not like that. I, I mean, moving your body in a way that mimics the sleek, graceful movements of a panther, for instance. Or, oh, yeah. Or like the the ability of a, of a cheetah to really balance its weight with its tail, so to speak. We don't have tails and we're not running 60 miles an hour. But the point is that fluid motion where you're oh, yeah. able to just move. And I was thinking this would be a lot of fun to do with my kiddo. So Absolutely. Tell me, tell me a little bit about your experience with that. Because I know you and your girls yeah. are great pals and you dance <laughs> around the kitchen. Yeah. But you also have this practice of animal flow, which is a lot well, it looks like a lot more fun than yoga. I don't want to step on the yogi's toes any harder than I already have. But yeah. <laughs> tell me about that. Have you done this with the teenage daughters and how do they? A little bit. Well, because like my kids are also clowns too. I mean, so like what I mean by like, so I, they've seen me practice this on my own, like in the living room, whatever. I am certified level one animal flow. So with that, I had to really practice a lot to be there. So my daughter impersonates me like a comic routine and she, so she makes up these things. Um, so it's, it is, but at the same time they have respect for it too. I mean, it's funny cause we, all three of us will be practicing our handstands. Like we'll be at a park somewhere doing this stuff. Um, and I'll have them stretch, not, not realizing that they're doing animal flow, but they'll have that motion. Cause I, um, so I'll just show them how to do a crab reach where they're reaching up and, and getting that stretch. Um, they're both like really awesome gymnasts anyway. So for that, like they show me things too. So it's kind of a give and take. Animal flow is mixed in, but I, so I don't think really organized with them. So um, what's, 
I got to understand yeah. this. If she's yeah. making comic book depictions of you doing animal flow, yeah. I imagine she's made up a few of her own moves. Oh yeah. What's what's your favorite? Because I'm I'm hearing so, like yeah. platypus or something. Like yeah. That. Well, she does like the flamingo and like things that I, like are not in the animal flow at all, but she'll make it. Yeah, whatever she can think of. She'll even do like dinosaur motions and all that kind of stuff. There has so yeah. <laughs> but then make yeah. So she finds her way to um to jab at me, which okay. which I enjoy that. T Rex so, on caffeine. Yeah, wow. Exactly. <laughs> exactly i like your kid <laughs> That's awesome. so yeah. i, I want to hear a little bit more about how yeah. this fits into the greater world yeah. regimen because i know you as a national academy of sports medicine instructor i know that you're very familiar with the opt model and for yep. those who haven't been following me for a while the, the opt model just at, at a quick quick high level is the idea that you progressively train different adaptations in order to prevent injury, to get better results for yourself through weight training and cardiovascular training, to have a larger vision of your program. And we call that a macro cycle. So, you know, yeah, I love that. For six to eight weeks, we do this, and six to eight weeks, we do this, and six to eight weeks, we do this, and then and then we come back through the model, so to speak, as a more advanced person, and so we can we can continue to progress ourselves toward our goals. So with that said, there are different levels and different phases of training, and if you're interested in learning more about that, I broke that down in a show called, it's a two-part show called unlocking your workouts full potential. And you can go find that on the podcast there. It, I think it was almost a year ago, actually. So if you want to know more about stabilization and uh, you want to learn more about strength, you want to learn more about power, you can go find it there. But tell us, Jared, how you're yep. fitting animal flow as a practice? Because it, it's not any one of those. It's a, a deep combination of all of yeah. those things. How are you fitting that into the overarching program? Is it one day a week? Is it your warm up cool down? Is it yeah. burst between weight training exercises? What does this look like? Well, for my program design of clients, it's um, stabilization. It fits it really well, but it's also not the entire workout by any means, um, but does fit really well with warm up and core. Mm. Um, so after they've done their foam rolling, their self mouth fascia release, their stretching, I can either get them on a cardio warm up, or I can use this animal flow motion stuff to get them like there's a lot, of tra a lot of traveling motions that work really well for getting their body ready for that workout. Now, of course, it's case by case on who I have and what they can do because a lot of people can't get on the ground yet. But like the, one of the motions in animal flow is called a static beast, where you're on all fours and you can raise your knees off the ground to hold your spine um, to really feel what it's like to, to make your core be working. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really, really good educational tool um, where I can mix in animal flow to do things. Now, if you can picture that happening where you're on all, on all fours, your knees are off the ground. So in other words, your, your feet and your hands are the only thing holding you up, but you're looking like you're crawling. Um, while that's happening, you're giving those cues where you're drawing in your belly button, you're stabilizing your shoulder blades, your, your elbows are locked out, your spine is neutral from your, your ears, shoulders, hips, and you can have them start doing things raising a foot off the ground, raising a hand off the ground, traveling to their left or right, traveling forward or back. This is really getting them to really feel what it's like to keep that spine stable. So as you know, in, in the OPT model and stabilization, we don't do movement of the lumbar spine. It's about anti-rotation, anti-motion to make sure you can actually hold that core where it needs to be. And that's exactly what happens in that format. Mm, so. I love that. So I encourage listeners, yeah. when you're thinking about the idea of incorporating animal flow concepts into your workout program, which we'll talk a little bit more in a second, but I encourage you to think about how often do you actually get down on the floor on all fours? Now I have a three-year-old, <laughs> we play all the time and that's you, that's like where all the fun starts. Dad gets down yeah. on all fours and, and you know, that's all she wrote for the next hour. You know, there's, and we try not to break vases and stuff. So <laughs> That, I mean, that's the life of a dad who has a three-year-old yeah. and is trying to play. But I mean, if you've got a little baby, you've got teenage daughters, maybe your kids have grown up and left the roost, you know, how often yeah. are you on all fours in the floor? Probably never. Probably, let's be real. Probably never. Yeah. And there are some intense stabilizing muscles that are responsible for a healthy, strong spine and for healthy neurological function throughout the body, for good function from your toes to your face, basically. No, and, absolutely. And what other way can you work that stuff? I'm thinking there isn't one. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's been a game changer and then some for me. I'm getting up there in years. I know I'm, I'm probably closer to having grandkids than my kids being little. That's a crazy <laughs> I point. mean, it is. Um, but with that said, I also have that goal long term that I do want to be on the ground with my grandkids and doing things like, holy, because even um, my, my wife's grandmother, um, man, she's pushing 90, if not beyond that. And she still is on the ground 
with kids. And it's just like really cool to see that because I don't see that anywhere else. My wife's from El Salvador and just kind of a different kind of background. But for what it's worth, they just seem to be more active people than the typical people of my side. Um, so it's just neat to see that. And I, wa I want to be that guy when I get older and older that I still can get up and down from the ground and have no issue from that. So. Uh, so here in here in Arkansas, we have Papa. Mm -hmm. Papa is 83 years old, and he's wow. standing in the kitchen. And Gabriel, my three-year-old, comes running by and just slams into the back of his knees. And you're like, as a parent, you're like, no, <laughs> you like see it happening. You're like, it's yeah. not my kid. We don't know. Wait, like, and, and, yeah. you know, you're like Gabriel. You play with dad like that, not Papa. Papa pats well. his head, you know, after getting almost knocked into the floor. <laughs> this is what life's all about alex like yeah. oh that's awesome if i can't take this it's time to go <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> what <laughs> wow that brings me to one of the points i love about animal flow is whether you're three years old learning how to control your body on the all fours or doing your ape walks like this is something kids can get into or 83 years old or i guess in your wife's mom's case 90. yeah <laughs> yeah you can incorporate this sort of thing i think that's one absolutely of the things that i do like about yoga is that it doesn't matter who you are what kind of shape you're in or what your mobility issues are you can incorporate aspects of yoga into your life and this animal flow sounds very very similar and oh yeah similar has it's been my experience in my practice Absolutely. I, I let people know techniques they can use to, when they're not feeling that great. Like we go back to some wrist mobility things to get them feeling better. Because that's the one thing they'll notice like, oh my gosh, my hands haven't felt like this forever before. Um, so we get them to understand it's okay. We can, you can take that break and get work to get yourself back to where you need to be um, and, and move into to who you are. But uh, there's been animal flow being used, utilized by this guy named Carl Sterling, who's one of my fellow master trainers for NESM. And he's, he's gone to people that have used it for um, Parkinson's disease. For Parkinson's disease, they've actually used animal flow to get people moving in a better way and have more cognitive awareness. So it's shown to, to have a lot of benefit because you're having to do some things where you're thinking a little differently and come, having things come alive because of that. Um, and the response has been great for it. So I, oh. I started a series on the show. We're still kind of in the middle of it called Exercise yeah. in the Brain. And, and the first show is, is why the brain matters. And one of the things that we talk about there yeah. is that your cerebellum, that's the back of your head, your cerebellum yeah. is wired in such a way that it's deeply connected to your motor function. Meaning, you know, when you see your coffee cup, I've got a coffee cup right here. You see your coffee cup, mm -hmm. you don't consciously in the front of your mind say, all right, hand, you need to move eight inches forward and then you need to close on this coffee cup yeah your cerebellum's in the back of your head literally in the back of your head but also in your subconscious controlling the motor function so when you see your coffee cup and you have the urge to grab your coffee cup it just happens it just, it just happens think about that for a while that'll mess with your head yeah <laughs> but your cerebellum is also the conduit through which so many systems in the brain wire through and one of the things that we talk about is when you can learn something new movement wise when you can learn how to do a proper squat, when you can learn how to jump, when you can learn how to do a handstand or in yeah. the end, one of the pluses for yoga is nobody does those movements on a regular basis. When you can learn how to do a good pose and, and use the right muscles and stabilize yourself and breathe, what happens is it increases the density of the cerebellum and studies show that the density of the cerebellum is protective against Alzheimer's disease. It's protective against wow. Parkinson's disease. It's protective against uh, losing memory function and whatnot. And there are so many different things that run through the cerebellum that we're just scratching the surface of what research has to say about that. All that to say, you've never tried animal flow. Yeah. You're learning new movements and different ways to control your body and different ways to connect with the floor or the space around you. That is a massively powerful way to challenge your motor function and to teach it something new. And, and we say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That is a lie with regard yeah, absolutely. to that is a lie. <laughs> These yeah. old dogs are learning new tricks every day. Yeah. Um, so I wanna kind of wrap this conversation about animal flow up. If you had, let's say, your, your top three tips to get started with animal flow for the average dad, the average mom, who maybe all you got to work with is a living room. You move your couch and your ottoman and you've got, you've got a space to work with, or maybe you hang out in your driveway. That's what we do in my house. <laughs> yeah, I do see videos of that, and pictures and of that. Our neighbors are like, what's wrong with these people? But, so what are yeah. your top three tips to getting started with an animal flow practice? Yeah, well, it's the way that we really get things moving. I hope I can summarize it in three movements but or three things. But like getting on all fours 
Yeah, and, and feeling what's happening with your body. What is called is activations in, in animal flow terms. It's we, we get our stretches going, but then we go into activations. And that's where you're being on all fours and you, again, just trying to see about lifting things up and seeing how your body is moving. So making, um, sure, making sure that our listeners understand this right. So yeah. you, get, you get on your hands and knees. Yeah. And your toes are touching the ground and your hands yep. are so, flat on the ground. Yep. And then you consciously control your body while you yep. pull your knees off the ground, correct? Yeah. So and even now, in the first... Yeah, first thing I'm thinking of, on your, while you're on all fours, you're locking out your elbows, and breathing is the first thing that kind of you're thinking about because you want to make sure that your core is, if your chest breathing and your lower back is arching, you're wasting your time. Mm-hmm. It needs to be that you're, the first thing you're thinking of is bracing that core. Shoulders are not, um, you're not going to be shrugging your shoulders. They're down and back. That alignment has to happen. For us in the world of NESM, we think the five pivot chain checkpoints happening on this thing too. We're making sure that we, those checkpoints are, are, in other words, your head, shoulders, hips, knees, feet. You're trying to see where things are. And then from there, if you can brace properly, now it's time to raise the knees off the ground. Yeah, so that's where it starts. And then going from there, from that position, I would go into a crab position. That's where your hands and feet are still on the ground, but now your face up. And, you're, and what we look for is your body to make the letter M. So from your feet to your knees to your hips to your shoulders to your hands making that letter M. And then from there, can you corkscrew your shoulders where they're back and you're stabilizing through your body, going back to the breathing thing, um, you're going to make sure that that M is happening, your belly button is drawn in, and your spine's not, again, not arching your lower back. And then can you get your hips one inch off the ground from that? Mm. And then from there, in that one inch off the ground, same thing. Can you lift a hand up? Can you lift a foot up? Uh, and then we usually start with feet are the easier ones. You start with feet, excuse me, then you go to your, your hands from there. And that's kind of where it starts. In the workout world, everybody knows what a plank is. Yep. If you hear people talk about the core being the foundation of a good weight training program, absolutely any program, it sounds to me like an animal flow. These two starting positions are the plank, so to speak, the all fours position and the crab walk position. And if you can control those, you can keep your head, your shoulders, your hips, your knees, your ankles in your consciousness, so to speak, and you're able to breathe well. And and I encourage people to try this. Do this for 60 seconds, all right? Like do it for 60 seconds to two minutes, just like you would a plank and see how hard you're working. Absolutely. Breathe and keep alignment. It is no joke from the outside looking in, people are going to be like, that's your workout. And you're going to be like, I'm working way harder than it looks right now. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I would encourage people not, I mean, I'm not trying to sell animal flow, but I would try honestly to get involved in it because it's like, um, you don't know until you know once you've done it. And that's the same thing when I took that that first class with Mike Fitch years and years ago, um, I was blown away by by how I felt. And it was because, and just like you're saying, it is, to me, this is where I start people before a plank. Because when I'm in that long, stretched out body plank, your body can easily compensate where your lower back is starting to feel more than it's supposed to because you don't know how to engage your core properly. But once you get those hips in that 90 degree angle, you actually can brace that core even easier where the low back won't take over. And then now I can actually bring the plank back from that awareness that you've gained from, from animal flow. Mm, I love that. So, and I, yeah. I work with people who regularly have injured themselves. So they've yeah. been a certain sort of shape before they've gotten injured. And the question is, how do we, well, you have two questions. You have, how yeah. do we secure the foundation so that from here on out, you're built on a rock and you don't do yeah. yourself again. Right. But also the second question is in the meantime, I don't want you to just like chill on the couch and get out of yeah. your workout habit and, and whatnot. It sounds to me like being able to control your body in three dimensions with something like animal flow is a powerful way to still stay moving and practical and habitual in your exercise while overcoming an injury. Yeah. And, and, and there's always regressions. And that's where um, us fitness professionals really um, have our place mm. is there might be people that aren't, aren't ready to go get down on the ground yet. But I can still mix things in where I have them on some kind of ledge where their hands are maybe the height of their knees. Um, in other words, some kind of ledge because we have those adjustable um, steps and things like that at the gym. Well, I'll put someone there and then have the same concepts happen where they're, again, having their abs drawn in, their spines are straight, and they're going to start lifting their legs up, even though their hands are elevated a couple feet off the ground. Jared's too humble to say yeah. this. I'm going to, I'm going to shamelessly <laughs> plug you real quick. If you're in the Colorado Springs <laughs> area and you need some help moving in three dimensions, or you're willing to take a trip, he'll, he'll help you out. He's at the, uh, the Colorado. You, well, we, we gave you the, the Facebook and Instagram. You can reach out yeah. to him there. So, so that's one. Wow. We're having yeah. a hard time summarizing in one sentence, aren't we? Oh. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's not your fault. This is good yeah. stuff. Let's keep doing it. <laughs> so I'll summarize here. If, so tip number one is to get good at the all fours position. I guess we'll put yeah. 
crab walk position? Is that the proper? Yeah, so it's it's a static crab and a static beast is what they're called. Okay. Um, so just thinking, about just like statically being in those those positions, and then yeah, we go from there. And again, another pair of eyes to watch is a huge thing. But for the, in the meantime, practice that. Mm, okay. I love that it's called the beast, by the way. So it's yeah. looking at you and you're like, that's not a workout. You're like, I'm in the beast position. <laughs> yeah, leave right? me alone. Beast mode <laughs> on. You go away and go do your thing. And exactly. Like, Someday you can be a beast. Yeah. That's right. Someday you can be just like me. Okay, that's perfect. I love that. So number yeah. two, what would you say is the, the number two tip to get started? Start applying motion um, to where now you are, just like you say, getting those different planes of motion in that stuff. Um, so that's where we start adding traveling to it. So we're, um, we're doing forward, we're moving backward, we're moving to the left, we're moving to the right. Exactly. And, and staying in tune with this, where our head, shoulders, knees, hips, and ankles are at the same time, correct? Yep. And then there is, the transverse plane even does come in this, in this world too, meaning that we are going to rotate our bodies where we transition from the beast to the crab. So like again, that's how it mixes in there. This they are start having that in there too. So. That's where that hip hop and then the exactly it looks in front of you and the floor thing. It looks very much like break dancing, yeah, because you're transitioning through. So yes, <laughs> perfect. Yep. Yeah. So we need a <laughs> box and we just need like oh yeah, like some Herbie Hancock and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah. so that's number two. Is start incorporating that forward, that backward. That's the yeah. sagittal plane. Then we got the the frontal plane, which is side to side, and then the transverse, which are the rotations between the beast and the crab. So that's number yeah. two. What would you say is the number three tip then to um, get into animal flow? Number three is trying to probably get your, um, your mobility, especially in the hips. Um, and there's, there's this one move, if anyone wants to look it up, I'm sure if you just went on YouTube and looked it for, but the side kick through. A side kick through, you're, if you see it, you're, you're going to be putting your weight on one arm, one leg, and coming through um, where one arm's in the air, the other opposite leg is going to the, the sideways position. Um, but you're getting that mobility, and it's, it's encouraged to open your hips. You're going to hear that a lot. There's another move where you have a, a, a scorpion reach. And a scorpion reach, you're also opening your hips. So I say the third thing is, is gaining that mobility in the joints that you've never had before. You have to be structurally sound and mobile. And that's where it kind of comes into play on that. But, and a lot of people don't know, like, the hips are so complicated. They're, they're, they really they are. They're the center point where all of the movement of walking and probably everything else <laughs> yeah. tends to stem from, right? Because you, you think about it, our, our shoulders and our hips are analogous from an evolutionary standpoint. They're you know where the limbs connect to the thoracic cavity, so to speak. Yeah. But, but your hips have to be able to control the full weight of your body. And you and I know this from teaching anatomy. Yeah. There's so many muscles in there. Oh yeah. So many ligaments and so many tendons and so many places where your joints. So people think like your hip bone is your only joint. That's not true. Where your pelvis yeah. and your sacrum, that's your, your, your sacroiliac joint. There's, there's movement there. You've got your lumbar spine, which is a part of that whole thing. We can't even start to break down all of the things that connect. So we just call it the thoracolumbar fascia. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Like that means all that stuff. Everything yeah. that wraps you around the hips there. So when Jared says that the number three thing is to be able to open up your hips and be able to, to be in tune with that hip mobility with those movements, it's not as simple as it sounds. Like this is the strength foundation, the mobility foundation for things like a deadlift, which is a a hip hinging movement yeah these are this is like lower back pain with regard to your running or your cycling or your walking even these things help with just about everything else that requires the hips which is just about everything else yeah well and yeah and not to make this too long but i think about like um, my first basic fitness mind like when, when i got in this career was how can i make all these muscles move to their full range of motion that was like where my focus went mm -hmm. and then as i've gotten throughout my career is knowing how these muscles sometimes can actually be holding you from not moving. And that's so important. I think about the gluteus medius, and actually its major role is to stop the hips from losing control and going too far left to right. And that's kind of where this comes from, is like knowing how to, I guess the third thing really put in one word would be control. Um, having to know when to say when on certain movements and knowing all right, how to fire what needs to fire naturally so you actually can keep your body in that controlled position, mm. no matter what position it's in. So just to make sure I got it in the listeners, yeah. one, start with the beast and the crab. Those yep. are the, the two foundational positions for animal flow if you're interested in getting into this. Uh, two, start incorporating movement, sagittal plane, frontal plane, transverse plane, yep. switching from beast to crab, and then moving forward, backward, left, to right. And then third is the control, especially in the hips, the ability yep. to control the hips while you're transitioning to 
different movements. And I imagine that branches into the big stuff, like your ape walking and your pigeon hopping and all of the, <laughs> all of the really uh, YouTube in preparation for our conversation. Yeah. YouTube, the, I think it was the 13 most difficult animal flow movements. And oh, wow. The guy is just beasting it. It's like his studio and he's just like, I, I can't even explain to you. My, my favorite was the frog hop, I think. He's like jumping yeah. off of, he starts in a, a frog position, hands and feet on the ground. And then he, he jumps and, and then he catches himself on his hands, absorbs the shock of the moment yep. coming into a handstand and then controls his body to come back to the frog position and then does it again. I was blown away. I tried oh, yeah. a couple of days ago. That is so hard. That is so <laughs> that is <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's, it's, it's humbling to the extreme because there is like choreography that they make for this where when you actually truly are doing animal flow, you're making this flow up into this really beautiful thing. And that's, that's the level you're trying to get to. Mm, that's powerful. Yeah. So is, I, yeah. I want to give you the last word about animal flow, just so our, our listeners can hear from you. Any last words you have about just the brief overview. And this is something we could talk about for hours. So this yeah. is a nice introduction to the concept and, and hopefully people will follow up with you and follow up with animal flow after this. So before we transition into what's going on in your dad bod world this year, yeah. What would you have to say to listeners as kind of an end note on the idea of animal flow? Well, I, my, the biggest thing that hit me going into animal flow was that um, getting out of your comfort zone was so powerful to me. And that was hearing Mike Fitch tell me that, like, what, that's what he did. That's kind of where I, what I'm feeling not very like, confident in myself. That's when I go for it. It's like, in other words, like, you know what? This is not about um, who cares what the people think. It's now time to see what I can do. And I'm, even though I know I'm not there yet, I'm going to practice it through. So just know for that, for I would say everyone go out there and try it. Get out there and see what your body can do because you'll 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 benefit. Nothing else out there does what this does. But I'd, I'd say gymnastics and yoga have have a place. But this is where it comes together where you actually have a chance to see what your body's made of. Man, so. that's that's powerful, yeah. and that's part of the yeah. growing process. We say you can't teach yeah. an old dog new tricks, but if you take that mind yeah. toward. I mean, really anything. There are people listening to this right now who don't go running and they're like, oh, I have bad knees. And <laughs> maybe you really do. Maybe you have bone yeah. on knee. Yeah. I was talking to a guy recently. He, he's lost 90 pounds in the last year, which is just crazy cool. He used to, he used to be in the 300s and now he's in the low 200s. And he, he was like, oh, I can't go running. I have bad knees. And I'm like, you had bad knees when you weighed 315 pounds. <laughs> Yeah. Every step of your run was seven times 315 pounds. That's over 2000 yeah. pounds per step. Now we're in the two hundreds. Now you're only 1400 pounds per step, right? Which means yeah. that uh, maybe your knees aren't as bad as you thought. Like get out of your comfort zone, go do something. So I love that you said that. That's a huge thing to just, I'm going to show, I, I told you I'd let you have the last word. Just, <laughs> it's okay. It's all good. Good points here. So let's talk about your dad bod challenges this year. Yep. Hey, it's, it's 2019. <laughs> These were your words, yeah. not mine. I'm getting up there, Alex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're not getting yeah. any younger. That's for sure. And yeah. Oh man, mind blowing to say, Hey, I'm probably closer to being a grandfather than I am from my kids being little anymore, which is just yeah. scary with two daughters, I'm sure. Yeah. So, but <laughs> I, what I love about you, Jared, is every single year you take on something new for yourself. And, you know, some years are probably more intense than others. But in the time that I've known you every year, you take on something new for yourself and you understand that your physical fitness is not only one, the foundation of your business as a trainer, you're a walking billboard for what you absolutely do. you're out of shape and you're not pursuing your own fitness goals. It's very hard to inspire anybody else to do the same. Right. And secondly, though, you understand it as a part of being a good man, husband, father, all around, you understand it to be a part of that. So you take on new challenges and I like that about you. So what's going on yeah. in, in 2019, man? What, what are the dad bod challenges for you in your journey to, uh, to define your dad bod? Yeah, well, um, I actually wrote this down yesterday for a different thing I was doing. Um, but I'm looking at, I know I don't make it sound too like broad stroke, but I'm looking for getting more mobile getting stronger and getting more flexible still. Um, and, and my goals like that one are like, how long can I maintain a handstand and then walk through that handstand? So like that's, that's kind of where I'm going with that one. Gaining more flexibility because while I'm in that handstand position, can I do the splits with my legs there? So like that's kind of where I'm looking for on that one. I'm always intrigued. Like my wife and I go to shows where we see like the Cirque du Soleil kind of things. And I don't know if I'll be at that level. But with that said, I want to see how far can I take this? In other words, like, can I climb a rope with just my hands at this age? Can I, can I make that happen? Can I 
Um, and this actually I got from you is can I hold on to a bar with just one arm? Then since I've seen you do that, I've done that, but it's like, took me a while. You made it look very easy. So I just like, <laughs> so much harder than it looks. Yeah. Oh yeah. One arm like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> exactly. But since, I mean, it took me probably who knows eight months to a year to do it, but now I actually can jump up and hold, mm. but it's like, it's, and that's, it's, it's inspiring. Like, you know what, there is, there's no more room for the attitude of I can't, it just can't be there. Yeah. So like, and then for a more spiritual aspect, I try and get away from things that are, that there's no more instant gratification kind of things. Um, I realized that I spent a lot of time wasted where I'm sitting in front of the TV and there's no benefit. Um, if I get my hands on a book, there's so much more reward from that or even interacting with people. Um, social media has killed us in the sense of how we don't have a chance to really interact and be in, in group, group involvement. So community wise, whatever it takes. I think that's another thing for my 2019. I know it's dad bod, but I think that will help my dad bod. If I can yeah. make myself have more interaction, that whole cortisol level, level should be in a better place. Um, we need that connection with people. And that's a big part for me. I, I love it. I'm a nerd, hardcore. Yeah. So you're like, hey, yeah. connect with people. That elevates, for those of you who don't know, the yeah. neurotransmitter oxytocin. And oxytocin is cortisol's like worst enemy. So if you're really stressed yeah. out being connected to people in your life or petting a dog or giving your wife, oh, yeah. that, I think of hearing you say that, I was thinking of yeah. the, uh, there's a meme going around right now. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a coffee shop that has a sign and the sign says, there's no Wi-Fi here. Talk to each other like it's 1995. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah, good. absolutely. That's good. Yeah. I love that. So dad bod for you, one of the things I love about your goals right now is you know, when I hear somebody say, Hey, I'm working on my deadlift and they're, they're working on getting heavier and that's cool. It's, it's cool to create strength and it's powerful for hip mobility. It's powerful for the strength of the thoracolumbar fascia and yeah. the above, right? It, it permeates a lot of different levels of physical fitness. However, there is a limit at some point, there is a limit how high you're going to be able to raise that deadlift. And I don't yeah. know what it is. You probably don't know what that limit is with regard to everybody's individual body, but absolutely 40. And I've, I've, I've lifted 500 pounds in the past and now I'm at 315. Does it make sense to keep trying to lift 500 pounds? I don't know. Is that <laughs> in my body? But yeah. the idea of saying, Hey, can I do a handstand? Can I walk with my handstand? Can I split my legs? You know, who knows what the limits are for being in touch with your own body with regard to age? Who knows what that is? Like you said, you've got, yeah. you've got grandma from El Salvador who can get in the floor with little kids at 90 years old. And I know 50 year old people who have a hard time getting in the floor. Absolutely. So when I hear your goals with dad bod, I, I love that. I love the idea that you could do this forever. You could do this yeah. until the day you die. What can I do new with my body this year? <laughs> yeah. And that's cool. You couldn't do that with a deadlift. You couldn't say, how much heavier than 500 pounds can I get? Because yeah. at some point, you reach the physical limit of the human body's ability to lift a weight off the ground. But with the body, who knows? Who knows what you can do? Yeah. Well, the philosophy of what am I doing it for hits me hard. And I was like, what am I really? Is this for a bragging right? I hope not. And that's the point. It's like, it's like, I want it to be where I'm doing something that makes me be a better me to everyone else. Um, so like my me deadlifting a ton of weight, it might be helpful, but is it what, what the reason behind it? And that's where I, where I wrap everything around in my personal training on how I would go through my routine is I have a focus on strength training, a focus on body weight training and a focus on, believe it or not, Olympic weight tra tra training. I want to still have that quick power. So there's a day in the week that I make sure that that's happening every week for all those things. Mm -hmm. um, so like on my Friday, that's my Olympic weightlifting day where I'll work on how powerful can I be. And then from there, I go on to my hanging work. And then that's kind of how it goes from there. So that's how you're working on strength. You're working on Olympic lifting. You're working on body yeah. and how all of those things fit together. Yeah, because it's it's um, and that's where I think why I enjoy what I do so much and for my own personal fitness is that I can, they, I can see all those things help. When I'm doing my animal flow stuff, I can tell it's helping my shoulders be stronger. So I'm doing like a kettlebell overhead press. It actually, they're helping each other out. I can tell I'm bracing better. I have more control. My range of motion is there. And I can be more powerful and keep my core where it needs to be as I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing on my hanging work and Olympic lifting stuff. Again, it's all accentuating on how my core is already there, stabilizing through all those movements. So it, it all helps. That's a, that's a powerful concept, the, the ability to transition yeah. skills from one movement to another. And this is yeah. probably worth an entire hour, so I won't really get into yeah. it. But the yeah. idea is, let's say you sit down and you do a shoulder press on a machine. Well, that's not going to help you with a barbell shoulder press. Studies Absolutely. And done that show that if you, if you train on a piece of equipment, 
to do shoulder press in a unilateral, excuse me, bilateral way, but only in that one plane of motion, then that doesn't help you to control a barbell along with your full body weight in a standing position. Absolutely. It's the same amount of weight. However, if you do a handstand push-up, which I know it's probably beyond quite a few people's skill set right now, but if you worked on a handstand and you got to where you could do a handstand push-up, that translates to the machine press, it translates to the standing barbell shoulder press, it translates to the dumbbells, and studies yeah. have been shown that that does translate when you're able Absolutely. to control your full body weight in a position like that. Some skills bleed over into other things, while other skills do not. And Absolutely. That's yeah. that's a pretty powerful concept, which, uh, thanks for that. I mean, that's good. <laughs> I'm gonna, oh, yeah. I'm going to on that for a while. Uh, as, yeah. as we're coming up on our, our time here, Jared, I yeah. love to give the people who come on my show their the last word, so to speak, the last say yeah. so everybody can hear hear a message coming from you. So uh, to the people who are listening, uh, if, if this is a relatively large show for Defining Dad Bod, that it could be in the thousands. So with regard to that, what would you have to say to everybody to leave them with on uh, Defining Dad Bod? That's a great, <laughs> a challenging, but um, I'd say that th one thing that's really helped me out of being um, married for 21 years, having teenage daughters, and trying to be in the world of fitness is having a thankful heart has been huge. Um, I know it might sound a little corny, but that's kind of real, really what drives me every day I wake up. I was in that, that car accident could have killed me. It didn't. My best friend passed away, but I carried on his legacy. Um, my daughter has a kidney disease, but we found hope in how we can keep it where she needs to be. Um, I've gone through my own challenges in this, in this career, but being thankful for what I have every day has been really with the driver that makes it all come together. Um, so waking up the fact that you, you, if you did wake up, start there <laughs> and then go and take on that day and be as positive as possible and see how you can influence others and be a servant um, more than anything. And that's really been how it's all come together for, um, for where I am. And then you're going to have those hard days, but that's where you realize and go back to being thankful. Man, I can't, I'm not going to add to that. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for that. Oh, you're Guys, on. this yeah. has been Jared Lagnus. You can catch Jared on Facebook at Jared dot Lagnus. That's J E R O D dot Lagnus L A N G N E S S. And you can also yeah. catch him on Instagram at Jared's Fitness. Jared, thanks so much for joining us today. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. To everybody else, until next time, kick butt, take names. Mm -hmm.